Good morning. I had the opportunity on that beautiful day yesterday to work in my garden, planted my spinach and all those other great spring stuff, and so very excited to see a little bit of rain to help that grow, and I know a lot of our farming friends have gotten their barley in and a few other things, so this is, this is a good day for rain, even though we don't always like it. We've come to worship our God, and it's always just such a privilege. In times when we can't gather with each other, we, I don't know, I think it's just, it's just really neat that we can still gather together, and it lifts up our hearts and it encourages us. And as we meet together, however we do that over um, a computer screen or out in the parking lot, we know that we're with God's people. And wherever God's people are, God says he is. And that's good news. Just a couple of announcements. Um, we're hoping, well, as you know, this is our 175th year, and we're just going to assume the whole year is a lockdown. But we'd still like to plan some activities and rejoicing for a church that has been faithful and God has been faithful to her. And so we're hoping that we can um, have some volunteers to kind of have a, a committee uh, session through a couple of ideas out there. One would be to create a video and we would invite people to give their greetings or their remembrances and uh, then have that pulled together. So if we could have a team that kind of uh, talks to people, invites them to make a video or helps them or whatever, that would be great. Also we're thinking of maybe a drive-through reception and there's a few ideas out there and uh, we would do it in the summertime rather than our normal October just for the sake of weather. So if you're willing to be a part of that, send me an email or talk to one of your elders. Our annual meeting May 2nd has now fallen under uh, lockdown, but we must forge ahead. Uh, there's um, reports that have to be uh, have to go out for the government and, and for the head offices and uh, so we do have to go ahead. We're hoping the annual reports will be available here at the church next week Sunday. For those of you who aren't able to pick it up, we will deliver it. Please read through it carefully. Uh, basically for the most part we're going to assume all is a yes. If it's not, you need to contact um, one of your elders, or <clears throat> in particular, Lynn, our treasurer. We will whittle down the annual meeting to the, the main questions, Presbyterian sharing, stipend, and budget. And um, that will be the voting that will take place on May the 2nd. So we will do it here at the church. We will include FM transmission. We will have an elder outside uh, for those of you in your cars. Um, should you have any uh, emergent type questions. So hopefully that's clear um, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure that'll work in one way or another. When we think of Jesus and having just come through Easter, we know that he was not a criminal and yet they killed him. They wronged him and yet he asked God to forgive them. He saved others, but he chose not to save himself. They killed him, yet he reigns today. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and place him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have been saved by your grace and your sacrifice through faith in Christ. We praise you, Jesus, our Christ, as you lay down your life for us. We recognize by your example that to truly become your disciples, we must deny ourselves. 
We now understand that we must lay our entire life on the altar as a willing offering and be willing and ready to say, not I, but Christ. As such, be our guide, Holy Spirit, that we might be prepared to say in all things, not our will, but yours be done. And help us take up our cross and follow you willingly and joyfully to your praise and glory. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've entered into a new month in terms of offering in the children's plate, we continue to give to the regular ministries of this congregation and to Presbyterian sharing. So we invite you to uh, note that on any giving you you have. And also this month for the month of April, we will be collecting for food for kids. Now that's a, a local Hamilton charity and they bring um, little packages of children who are um, underfed, send home some food with them, particularly for the weekends. Now with the pandemic, those backpack type things are not going out, but they are receiving gift cards to purchase their own foods this year. So um, we continue to give generously through our children's plate as well. As we think of the way that we give, to God and to others, it's a part of how we deny ourselves and how we declare with one heart and mind, we've decided to follow Jesus. So we're going to sing that right now. Easter that our whole lives were turned upside down and so we're just gonna see if we can get a PowerPoint up there or not we're, we're gonna try it this week but it's not our friend I just want to say it's not my friend okay we'll give her a try so how can something that is upside down, actually be right side up. This is what we talked a little bit on Easter Sunday, and we're gonna have a look at that over the next couple of weeks. So for instance, the word swims, upside down, still spells swims. You see that? For those of you in the car, take a piece of paper, try it out. In block letters, I might add. If poison expires, the question is, is poison more poisonous? What do you think? Um, I have twins, and I've often wondered if one of them realized they weren't planned. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Can we get to the next? 
slide? Yeah, there we go. Aren't they beautiful? A hundred years ago, everyone owned a horse and only the rich had cars. And today, everyone has cars and only the rich own horses. Paradox defined. It's a statement contrary to common belief, a statement that seems contradictory, unbelievable, or absurd, but that actually might be true. Now, paradoxes are not contradictions. A, a contradiction is, I really am concerned about my health, and so I order deep fried chicken and fries with gravy every day. That's a contradiction. The world is full of paradoxes, which highlight things that just don't seem right, such as there are more philosophies but narrower viewpoints. We have more means of communicating, but we communicate less. We spend more money on things, but we enjoy them less. We have more conveniences, but less time. We have more knowledge, but less discernment. Well, scripture, likewise, can be full of paradoxes. And we'll look at that over the next, four, uh, next few weeks. And our first paradox this week is, we save our life by losing it. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Mark 8. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it? for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. The scripture tells us that Jesus is the primary testimony of one who lost his life in order to save it or in Jesus case his life lost saved others you see Jesus ministry drew quite a following and disrupted the power perceived by the religious leaders who felt that the power belonged to them and and they had a nice little situation going on they they had carved out for themselves the right to continue worshiping under Roman rule, and they didn't want to upset that apple cart. But Jesus keeps on winning people over, and so these religious leaders in John 11 gather together, and they plot against Jesus. As the scripture says, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people then the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. And so it was that Jesus' life was lost so that the whole of humanity could be saved from the darkness of sin. What was once considered death is now life because of the resurrection. It's true that few today understand the sacrifice of giving up a life for many. 
Few are willing to give even the smallest of their benefits for others. It is true that in early Christianity, particular all of the apostles were martyred for sharing their faith. And whether you know it or not today, in 2020, nearly eight Christians were martyred every day over the last 365 days, killed because of their faith in Christ. But this isn't our immediate reality for us sitting here today. I don't know if one day it might be. What then of our lives are we hanging on to or must we lose? How tied to Christ do we feel? Would we die for him? What must we hear today in our own way without the fear of impending death or martyrdom? What might we need to give up to set others free? Could it be the things that we hold on to, our attachments, our desires, our preferences, our very self-driven will, and submit them fully and dedicate our lives to the Father's will? Are we willing to die to ourselves for the sake of Christ? Jesus didn't live for the things of this world. You see, Jesus didn't put value into having a girlfriend or getting married. His value wasn't in having children. He didn't live to have a beautiful home. In fact, scripture says he had no place to rest his head. He didn't obsess, I, at least scripture doesn't tell us that, over fitness or healthy eating so that he could live a long life because he knew that he would die at 33-ish. Jesus didn't focus on building a career. He didn't live for the stuff and the things that surrounds most of our lives today. If he had, would the rest of the world have considered his life worthless or wasteful? I mean, after all, he just walked around and chatted with people. What is it that we live for? Can we look at that this morning? Is our main purpose to accomplish, to achieve, to store up? Is our priority the kingdom of God? Nurturing our faith, growing in knowledge, taking time to help the poor, minister to families both near and far. Do we ever stop running around from doing all of the things in life? to sit down and teach our children, our grandchildren, about how to live for God and share the great stories of faith that we find in the Bible and how to serve others. Can we teach one another that? Do we focus and take time for God? I'm not preaching that we can't have the things of this world or that what we accomplish isn't worth celebrating and that we should work hard. But to lose our life in this world is to sincerely ask, what are my priorities? Is there space for Jesus and God's kingdom in my life? Why do we put off building up and practicing our faith? Do we think that we will live forever? Has, has COVID not taught us? Has accidents not taught us? Has illness not taught us that we could die tomorrow? Let's be real. You have a 100% chance of dying. And the thing is, you don't know when, no matter how much you try to control it. Have you lived your life for Jesus in the meantime? A Christian businessman once prayed and wrestled with why God gave him this incredible gift to make money. The, the guy just makes money hand over foot. And his question was, should I continue making a lot of money because I can? Or should I sell everything and become a missionary? He settled on the fact that he was good at making money. But because he realized that it was a gift from God, this business savvy, his motivations changed. Yes, he continued to make a lot of money. He had things of this world, no doubt. But he became a very, very generous philanthropist. 
knowing full well that his money was not his but belonged to God. And so it was that whoever asked received. Life can be confusing at the best of times. Just one moment. I hit a wrong button. This is when papers are a good thing, right? Okay, I guess start over again here. One moment. Comedian who immigrated from Russia. Yakov Smirnov, who observed that upon immigrating to North America, he said, I realized it was a culture of immediate gratification in which when I went to the grocery store, I saw that there was something called powder milk. You just add water and you get milk. And then he said, I saw something that said powdered orange juice in which you could just add water and you would get orange juice. And then he said, and then I went to another aisle and I saw a baby powder and wondered, my goodness, what an incredible country. <laughs> there is no Jesus to which we just add powder and water and get immediate gratification. I, I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that as soon as you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that life is going to be hunky-dory. It isn't just about adding a confession and adding a bit of this, some religious practices, and so on. Jesus says that we're called to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. You see, following Jesus costs us everything. We have to lose our life. And how can we not, when we come to the foot of the cross, face to face with the suffering Christ and we realize we've done an awful lot of living for ourselves. I've done a number of funerals over the years and I have to say I've never once witnessed a burial in which cash, jewels, or a Corvette were tucked into the grave. I've never heard a testimony, gosh, I'm so glad that I worked so hard that I never spent any time with my family. I've never heard a declaration, it's so great that I didn't nurture my faith so I could be so busy. Nor have I ever heard all that gaming and TV watching that I did in my life was the best time that I ever spent and I don't regret ever having not had time to help others. I've only heard the opposite, usually when it's too late. You see, words are not enough. We have to turn those regrets upside up. It's true. We can step away from the cross at Good Friday with our double fists clinging on to all of our different attachments, our things, our dreams, our desires, our busyness, our wants. But in saving our lifestyle, Jesus says, you may lose something far greater. What does it profit anyone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? If we lose our life for Christ's sake, we find greater enrichment in this life. There is much joy when you minister to someone and they give a simple smile or a thank you or you know that their life has been touched. It isn't the things of this world that we live for, but for God's kingdom. And for all our striving, our work, and our running around, we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Our call is to follow Jesus. This is the great paradox of the cross. In losing his life, Christ saved ours. In losing our life, we gain Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do acknowledge that we live a life of immediate gratification. 
and we're all guilty of it. There's, there's so much in this world that satisfies us so quickly, and yet we've come to realize it doesn't last, and we have to go looking for the next thing that excites us. Perhaps in a paradoxical way then, Jesus, we, we thank you for COVID, for lockdowns. There's not very many people who say that, I know. But it's taught us to just take life a little easier. And we don't always like the space that we have with ourselves, but we pray, Jesus, that you would enter into that and teach us the way of your kingdom that we would use this time to reflect on the cross that we have just walked away from. And that you would call us to pick up our cross. And Lord, we, we know that being a Christian isn't always easy, and yet we've also deeply experienced how grace has changed our lives. The way in which that you have healed our minds, our souls, our relationships, our bodies. Lord, we, we can't just turn around from that. We, we continue to meet with you. We continue to seek you because we know that you are real. And so help us to lay down those things that we cling on to and that we pick up every day. Lord, we, we do thank you for all the incredible gifts that we have, our, our cars, our homes, our families. Lord, may we recognize afresh today that none of it belongs to us, but they are gifts from you to be used to bless others and to share the good news of your kingdom. And so, Father, we long to be an Easter people who have taken our upside-down lives and turned them upside up. May we speak up for justice. May we give generously to those who ask. May we minister to those who are sick, who are lonely, who are poor. May we even feel uncomfortable when we get too caught up in our own world so that you call us back to your will and your desire. And so, Father, we give up this space, this time that we have taken to worship, and we pray it will be glorifying to you. We pray it would encourage our hearts. And Father, as we pray this morning, may those who need a prayer, who need a touch of your healing hand, who need your presence, may they receive it now in Jesus' name. And Lord, for all of our struggles and our questions, we pray that you would guide us to the answers, guide us to the cross, guide us to Jesus who loved us so much that he laid down his life so that no one would be lost, no one would perish but find eternal life in Christ our Lord. This is our hope. This is our song. And you are the one whom we follow. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's sing our call is to follow Jesus.
as we go out, stand for a blessing of our God. Go out now, brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Peace, love, and faith. From God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.